Part A. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a nurse talking to a patient called Mihira. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Mahira. How can I help you today? Good morning, nurse. I've been having some problems and I'm really worried. I've been feeling extremely tired all the time and I've noticed I've gained a lot of weight recently. I see. Can you tell me a bit more about the tiredness? When did it start? It's been going on for about six months now. I used to be so energetic, but now I struggle to get out of bed in the morning. Even simple tasks like cooking dinner feel like a huge effort. And can you describe the weight gain? How much weight have you put on approximately? Oh, no, don't ask me that. I've been avoiding mirrors because I don't like what I see. 10 kilograms yes, I've probably gained around that much in the last year. My clothes are all too tight. I understand how upsetting that must be, Mihira. Have you noticed any other symptoms along with the tiredness and weight gain? Yes, I have experienced menstrual irregularities. My periods have become unpredictable, both in terms of when they start and how long they last. Additionally, the menstrual flow has significantly increased, resulting in heavy bleeding. I've also been dealing with severe mood swings, characterized by rapid and intense emotional changes. To make matters worse, I've developed acne, with pimples appearing on my face and body. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Have you experienced any hair loss or changes in your body hair? I haven't experienced any thinning or shedding of hair on my scalp. However, I've noticed an increase in unwanted hair growth on my face and body. This excessive hair growth is causing me a great deal of embarrassment and self-consciousness. It sounds like you're going through a tough time. Have you tried anything to lose weight, Mihira, like dieting or exercise? I've experimented with various dietary plans in an attempt to lose weight, but unfortunately, none of them have yielded the desired results. Previously, I maintained a consistent exercise routine at the gym, but my energy levels have significantly declined recently, making it difficult to sustain my physical activity. I see. Let's talk about your medical history. Do you have any chronic conditions like diabetes or thyroid problems? No, I don't have any chronic conditions. My family has a history of heart disease, but that's about it. Okay, and do you smoke or drink alcohol, Mahira? No, I don't smoke or drink. Based on what you've described, I think it might be polycystic ovary syndrome. It's a hormonal imbalance that can cause these symptoms. I've heard of that. I'm really worried. What can I do? Don't worry, Mahira, we can help. I'm going to refer you to see a gynecologist for a blood test to confirm the diagnosis. The blood test will check your hormone levels. Okay, that's fine. What about treatment? Will I need medication? Once we receive your blood test results, we can determine if medication is necessary to regulate your hormone levels. This treatment option would aim to balance your hormonal system. Additionally, we can work together to implement lifestyle modifications, such as dietary adjustments and regular exercise, which can significantly contribute to managing your symptoms and improving your overall well-being, Mahira. Thank you for your help. I feel a bit better knowing there might be an explanation for what I'm going through. You're welcome, Mahira. In the meantime, try to get plenty of rest and eat a healthy diet. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physiotherapist talking to a patient called Mihira. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Good morning, Mihira. What brings you in today? Good morning, doctor. I've been having these really irritating pimples all over my body. They're filled with fluid. I see. When did you first notice these pimples? It started about 15 days ago. I've been feeling feverish, weak, and just generally unwell. And how have you been feeling since then? The fever has finally subsided, but my skin condition has worsened. The pimples have become more numerous and inflamed, causing intense itching that is driving me crazy. To top it off, I feel constantly exhausted and drained of energy. I see. Can you tell me a bit about your routine in the past few weeks? Any changes, Mihira? Yes, to cut down on expenses, I switched to taking the bus to work approximately a month ago. Given the recent onset of my symptoms, I'm considering the possibility of having been exposed to an illness during my bus commutes. Have you tried any medication for the pimples? Yes, I bought an over-the-counter antihistamine, Claritin, but it hasn't helped much. All right, let me examine you. Sure. Mihira, based on your symptoms and the appearance of the rash, I believe you have chicken pox. Chicken pox? But I thought that was a childhood disease. While chicken pox is often associated with childhood, adults can contract the virus as well. However, the symptoms tend to be less severe compared to those experienced by children. What can be done right now? I'm going to prescribe you an antiviral medication called acyclovir to help shorten the course of the illness. It's important to take all of the medication as prescribed. Okay, doctor. To help with the itching, you can take over-the-counter antihistamines like Benadryl. Calamine lotion can also provide relief. Avoid scratching as it can lead to infection. Got it. Anything else I should know? Yes, Mihira. It's crucial to minimize contact with pregnant women, newborns, and individuals with compromised immune systems as they are particularly susceptible to severe complications from chickenpox. To aid your body's recovery process and prevent further spread of the virus, ample rest is essential. Sure, doctor. Well, will I lose my hair? I've heard that can happen. Hair loss is a rare complication of chickenpox and usually occurs in severe cases. You don't seem to have a severe case, so it's unlikely. That's a relief. How long will it take for the rash to clear up? Usually, the rash starts to improve within a week and clears up completely within two to three weeks. It's important to keep the area clean and dry to prevent infection. Okay. Is it contagious? Yes, chickenpox is highly contagious. That's why, Mahira, it's important to avoid contact with others, especially pregnant women and people with weakened immune systems. You should also avoid sharing personal items like towels and bedding. I'll be careful. Thank you for all the information, doctor. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a nursing manager talking to a junior nurse called Mihira. Now read the question. Mihira, I need you to double check the infusion pumps on the night shift. We've been having issues with the new model, the AcuFlow 3000. Several patients have experienced medication errors due to inaccurate flow rates. Okay, Linda. I'll be extra vigilant. Anything specific to look for? Yes, the primary concern is the calibration. If the pump is off by even a tenth of a milliliter per hour, it can lead to serious complications. Also, watch for the alarm system. We've had instances where it's malfunctioned, causing delays in patient care. And, there's been a software glitch affecting the bolus function. Make sure you're familiar with the workaround. Got it. I'll review the procedure manual again. I'll also cross-check the flow rates with the four bags to be sure. Good. And remember Mihira, if you encounter any problems, don't hesitate to call the biomedical team. 
Patient safety is our top priority. Question 26. You hear a doctor talking to a nurse called Mihira. Now read the question. Mihira, I'm concerned about patient 12B, Mr. Paul. His condition is deteriorating faster than anticipated. We've increased the dosage of the antibiotics, but his vitals are still unstable. His oxygen saturation levels are dropping, and his blood pressure is fluctuating. I've been monitoring him closely, Dr. Mayfield. His fever has spiked again, and the wound seems to be showing signs of increased inflammation. I've already notified the lab for repeat blood cultures. Good. We need to act quickly. I'm considering transferring him to the ICU for closer monitoring. His respiratory status is a major concern. I want to avoid intubation if possible, but we need to be prepared. Also, prepare a consult with the infectious disease specialist. I suspect we might be dealing with a more resistant strain of bacteria. I'll get on it right away Dr. Mayfield. I'll also double-check the four fluids and ensure he's receiving adequate hydration. That's crucial. Dehydration can exacerbate his condition. Mihira, keep me updated on any changes. Question 27. You hear a nurse talking to a junior nurse called Mihira. Now read the question. Mihira, we've got a patient, room 302, who needs a Foley catheter inserted. He's been experiencing urinary retention and is in quite a bit of discomfort. Okay, Leah. I'll get the necessary supplies. Anything specific to watch out for? Yes, a few things. The patient is on anticoagulants, so we need to be extra careful to prevent hematuria. Also, He's had multiple catheterizations before and has a history of UTIs. So, sterile technique is paramount. And, given his discomfort, we need to be gentle and explain the procedure clearly to reduce anxiety. Got it. I'll make sure to use a lubricant and inflate the balloon slowly. I'll also monitor his urine output closely for any signs of infection. Good. And Mihira, remember to document everything accurately including the catheter size, the amount of water used for the balloon, and the time of insertion. Question 28. You hear a physiotherapist talking to a patient called Mihira. Now read the question. Mihira, we're going to discuss walking aids today. Given your recent surgery and limited weight-bearing capacity, we need to find the right one for you. A walker provides the most stability but can be cumbersome indoors. Crutches offer more mobility but require upper body strength. And then there's the cane, which is lightweight but offers less support. I'm worried about falling. Which one would be safest? Safety is our priority. A walker is generally considered the safest, but it depends on your specific needs. We'll assess your balance, strength, and gait to determine the best option. Remember, it's not just about preventing falls, but also about aiding in your recovery and improving mobility. We might even consider a combination of aids for different environments. Okay, I understand. I just want to be able to get around independently as soon as possible. We'll work towards that goal. But Mihira, remember, rushing the process can lead to setbacks. It's important to listen to your body and gradually increase your activity level. We'll adjust the walking aid as needed. Question 29. You hear a GP talking to a neurologist called Mihira. Now read the question.
Mahira, I'm calling about a patient, Mrs. Peter. She experienced her first seizure yesterday. It lasted about two minutes, with tonic-clonic movements and subsequent confusion. Her medical history is significant for hypertension and type 2 diabetes, but no prior neurological issues. Thanks for the information, William. A first-time seizure in an adult is always concerning. We need to rule out metabolic causes related to her diabetes. Has she experienced any changes in her blood sugar levels or insulin regimen? She's been managing her diabetes well, but I'll certainly check her recent blood tests. No significant changes in her insulin routine. I've already ordered an EEG to assess brain activity. Good. An EEG is essential. We'll also need to consider imaging studies like an MRI to rule out structural abnormalities. Given her age and medical history, I lean towards a possible metabolic or vascular cause, but we need more data. I agree, Mahira. I'm concerned about the potential for stroke or transient ischemic attack. We need to act swiftly. Absolutely. Let's keep in close communication. I'll schedule an appointment for her as soon as possible. Question 30. You hear a chief surgeon called Mihira talking to nurses. Now read the question. All right, nurses, let's address the new tablet system. I know there's been a steep learning curve, but it's crucial for efficient patient care. The system is designed to streamline documentation, reduce errors, and improve communication. I'm concerned about patient privacy, Dr. Mihira, especially when documenting sensitive information. Security is paramount. The tablets have robust encryption, and access is restricted to authorized personnel. Always log out when stepping away from the device. What about battery life? It seems to drain quickly during long shifts. We're aware of the battery issue. We're working on a solution, but for now, ensure the tablets are fully charged before your shift and utilize power-saving modes. We've also installed charging stations in strategic locations. Well, Dr. Mihira, I'm having trouble with the medication administration module. It's often slow to load. The system is still undergoing optimization. For critical medications, double-check with the pharmacy and document manually as a backup until the issue is resolved. We're prioritizing a fix for this. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. You hear the conversation between a general practitioner, Dr. Mihira, and an interviewer. Good afternoon, Dr. Mihira. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today about the pressing issues in the healthcare system. To start, can you describe the major crisis that the healthcare system is currently facing? Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. 
The healthcare system is indeed grappling with several challenges right now, but perhaps the most glaring is the daunting strain on its infrastructure. We're witnessing a perfect storm where the increasing demand for medical services, largely due to an aging population and the prevalence of chronic diseases, is clashing with an already under-resourced and overburdened system. The pandemic exacerbated these issues, exposing cracks that were already present but have since widened. We are at a critical juncture where the capacity of our healthcare system to provide adequate care is being severely tested. The shortage of healthcare professionals, especially nurses and doctors, has resulted in hospitals being stretched to their limits, causing significant delays in patient consultations and treatments. This crisis isn't just about resources, it's about the very sustainability of our healthcare system. That sounds extremely concerning, especially when it comes to patient care. Mihira, how do these delays in consultation impact patient safety? The delays in consultations are indeed a serious concern. When patients can't get timely access to healthcare professionals, it can lead to a cascade of negative outcomes. For instance, conditions that could have been managed or treated early on may progress to more serious stages, requiring more complex and costly interventions later. This is particularly true for chronic conditions like diabetes or hypertension, where regular monitoring is crucial. Additionally, the backlog in consultations means that acute cases, which might not seem critical initially, can become emergencies by the time they are seen. From a safety perspective, this delay increases the risk of medical errors as the healthcare system operates under pressure, with professionals working longer hours and handling larger caseloads than what is typically safe. There's also a psychological toll on patients who experience anxiety and uncertainty while waiting for care, which can worsen their overall health outcomes. Mihira, you mentioned the shortage of healthcare professionals earlier. How has the shortage of nurses specifically contributed to the current crisis? The shortage of nurses is one of the most critical aspects of the current healthcare crisis. Nurses are the backbone of our healthcare system, providing essential care, managing patient needs, and ensuring the smooth operation of healthcare facilities. However, the pandemic has not only increased the demand for nursing care but has also led to burnout and attrition within the profession. Many nurses have left the field due to the overwhelming stress, insufficient compensation, and lack of support, creating a vicious cycle where the remaining nurses are overworked, leading to further burnout and resignations. This shortage means that patients receive less attention and the quality of care diminishes. In some cases, entire wards or departments have had to reduce their capacity because there simply aren't enough nurses to staff them. The shortage also complicates efforts to manage the patient load, particularly in emergency situations, and compromises the ability of the healthcare system to respond effectively to crises. Given the severity of the situation, what actions has the government taken to address these challenges Mihira? The government has indeed recognized the severity of the situation and has taken several steps to mitigate the crisis, though the effectiveness of these measures is still up for debate. On one hand, there have been efforts to increase funding for healthcare, including emergency funding to recruit and retain healthcare workers, particularly nurses. Additionally, there have been initiatives to streamline the certification process for foreign-trained nurses and doctors to quickly bring them into the workforce. There have also been investments in telemedicine to alleviate some of the pressure on physical healthcare facilities by providing virtual consultations. However, these measures are often seen as reactive rather than proactive. The systemic issues that led to the current situation, such as underfunding and poor workforce planning, remain largely unaddressed. Furthermore, the implementation of these initiatives has faced bureaucratic delays, which undermines their potential impact. The situation requires a more holistic and sustained approach, but the government's response so far has been more about managing symptoms than curing the underlying disease. It sounds like the situation requires not just government intervention but also a proactive strategy from healthcare professionals. Mihira, what strategies are doctors like yourself employing to manage this crisis? Indeed, as healthcare professionals, we cannot simply wait for systemic changes, 
we must take immediate steps to manage the situation on the ground. One key strategy has been to prioritize cases based on urgency and potential outcomes. Triage systems have been enhanced to ensure that the most critical patients receive attention first, while those with less severe conditions are managed through alternative means such as telehealth or outpatient services. Another approach has been to increase the collaboration between different healthcare providers to share resources and expertise. For instance, we've been working more closely with community health centers and private practitioners to distribute the patient load more evenly. Additionally, many of us are focusing on patient education, empowering patients to manage their own conditions where possible, and providing them with the tools and knowledge to make informed decisions about their health. This not only alleviates some of the pressure on healthcare providers but also helps improve patient outcomes in the long term. We are also advocating for better mental health support for healthcare workers, recognizing that we cannot provide the best care if we ourselves are burnt out and stressed. That's an admirable approach. Finally, what recommendations do you have for the public during this challenging time, Mahira? My primary recommendation to the public is to be both patient and proactive. The healthcare system is under tremendous strain, so it's crucial for individuals to take responsibility for their health as much as possible. This means staying on top of chronic conditions, adhering to prescribed treatments, and seeking medical advice early if you notice any changes in your health. Prevention is always better than cure, and in times like these, it's more important than ever. I also urge the public to make use of alternative healthcare options, such as telemedicine, which can provide timely consultations without the need to visit overwhelmed hospitals. Additionally, understanding and cooperating with triage systems in place is vital. If you're advised to wait or manage a condition at home, trust that this decision is made with the entire community's health in mind. Finally, I would encourage everyone to advocate for better healthcare policies. This crisis has shown that our healthcare system needs significant reform, and public support is essential for driving the changes that will ensure everyone has access to the care they need, both now and in the future. Thank you Dr. Mahira, for sharing your insights. It's clear that this is a multifaceted crisis that requires action from all stakeholders. Your advice will undoubtedly help many people navigate these challenging times. Now look at Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear a social worker talking about the research conducted at the Mihira Research Center. You now have 90 seconds to read questions. Good day everyone. As a social worker deeply involved in understanding the complexities of mental health, I'm honored to present the findings from a critical study conducted at the Mihira Research Center. This research delves into the emotional and psychological responses of patients battling various illnesses with a specific focus on depression. Today, 
I will walk you through the genesis of this study, the collective first response from our 596 participants, and an in-depth exploration of four key patients, referred to as Mahira 1, Mahira 2, Mahira 3, and Mahira 4, to maintain confidentiality. Each of these cases presents a unique lens through which we can better understand the intersection of physical illness and mental health, particularly depression. The Mahira Research Center embarked on the study with a mission to comprehend the profound psychological impact that chronic and severe illnesses have on patients. Depression, often a silent companion to physical ailments, is an area that requires more focused attention. Our team was particularly interested in identifying the common threads in the emotional responses of patients to their illnesses, as well as the distinct variations that emerge depending on personal, medical, and social contexts. The research involved a diverse group of 596 patients suffering from a range of chronic illnesses, including, but not limited to cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and autoimmune disorders. The study was designed to explore the onset and progression of depressive symptoms in these patients, starting from their diagnosis through to their ongoing treatment. We conducted in-depth interviews, psychological assessments, and longitudinal follow-ups to ensure a comprehensive understanding. While each patient's experience with illness and depression is unique, we noticed that certain patterns and responses were prevalent across the board. For the purpose of this presentation, we will focus on the four major responses that encapsulate the varied emotional landscapes of our participants. The cases of Mahira 1, Mahira 2, Mahira 3, and Mahira 4 have been selected as representative examples to illustrate the diversity and complexity of depressive responses to illness. Upon diagnosis, the immediate response of many patients was a mix of shock, disbelief, and a profound sense of loss. These emotions are natural, as receiving a diagnosis of a severe or chronic illness often marks the beginning of a life-altering journey. However, for many of our 596 participants, these initial feelings quickly spiraled into a more deep-seated emotional struggle, manifesting as depression. The study revealed that the majority of patients experienced an overwhelming sense of uncertainty about their future, coupled with a fear of becoming a burden to their loved ones. This fear often translated into feelings of worthlessness and hopelessness, which are key indicators of depression. Additionally, many patients reported a marked decline in their interest in daily activities and a pervasive sense of fatigue that was not solely attributable to their physical condition. Interestingly, the patient's social support networks played a significant role in either mitigating or exacerbating their depressive symptoms. Those with strong, empathetic support systems were somewhat shielded from the full brunt of depression, while those who felt isolated or misunderstood by their loved ones experienced more severe symptoms. This first collective response highlighted the critical need for holistic care approaches that address both the physical and mental health of patients. Mihira 1 was a 45-year-old female diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer. Her initial response was one of denial. Despite the clear prognosis from her medical team, she refused to accept the severity of her condition, choosing instead to focus on maintaining her daily routine and responsibilities. Her denial was a coping mechanism, allowing her to temporarily shield herself from the emotional pain associated with her diagnosis. Over time, however, this denial gave way to an intense period of depressive symptoms. Mihira 1 reported feeling increasingly detached from her surroundings and loved ones, often describing her days as though she were moving through a fog. She struggled with feelings of guilt for not being able to care for her family as she once had, which further fueled her depressive state. Despite these challenges, there was a notable resilience in Mihira 1's approach to her illness. She sought counseling and gradually learned to confront her fears and emotions, leading to an improvement in her mental health, albeit with ongoing challenges. Mihira One's case underscores the complex relationship between denial, depression, and resilience. While denial initially served as a protective barrier, it ultimately delayed her emotional processing, intensifying her depressive symptoms when the reality of her illness became unavoidable. Mihira II was a 60-year-old male suffering from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. His illness severely limited his mobility and social interactions, leading to profound social isolation. 
Unlike Mihira 1, who had a supportive family network, Mihira 2 lived alone, with only occasional visits from distant relatives. The isolation he experienced was a significant factor in the development and exacerbation of his depression. Mihira too frequently expressed feelings of abandonment and invisibility, which were compounded by his inability to engage in activities he once enjoyed, such as gardening and attending community events. His depressive symptoms were marked by deep-seated loneliness, a pervasive sense of emptiness, and a growing disinterest in life itself. Despite attempts by healthcare providers to involve Mihira too in support groups and social activities, his depression remained severe, largely due to his persistent feelings of isolation. His case highlights the critical role that social connections play in mental health, particularly for patients with debilitating physical conditions. Mihira III was a 38-year-old male diagnosed with an aggressive form of lymphoma. His response to his illness was dominated by an overwhelming fear of mortality. Unlike Mihira I and Mihira II, whose depressive symptoms were closely tied to their daily lives and social contexts, Mihira III's depression was fueled by existential anxiety. From the moment of his diagnosis, Mihira III became preoccupied with thoughts of death and dying. This preoccupation led to intense bouts of anxiety, which gradually morphed into a deep depressive state. He struggled with insomnia, experienced frequent panic attacks, and often expressed feelings of despair about the future. What made Mihira III's case particularly challenging was the intersection of his depression with his physical symptoms. The aggressive nature of his lymphoma meant that his treatment was equally aggressive, leading to significant physical side effects. These physical struggles only reinforced his depressive thoughts, creating a vicious cycle that was difficult to break. Despite these challenges, Mihira III eventually found solace in existential therapy, where he was able to explore and confront his fears about mortality. His journey was marked by ups and downs, but it ultimately led to a reduction in his depressive symptoms, although his fear of mortality remained a significant aspect of his mental health landscape. Mihira IV was a 52-year-old female diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Her initial response to her diagnosis was one of determination. She was resolved to manage her illness and continue caring for her family. However, as her condition progressed, the physical pain and limitations imposed by her illness began to take a toll on her mental health. Mihira IV's depression was primarily driven by the burden of responsibility she felt toward her family. As someone who had always been the primary caregiver, the shift in roles, where she now required care, was emotionally devastating. She struggled with feelings of inadequacy, guilt, and a fear of being seen as a burden. These emotions led to a significant decline in her mental health, manifesting as chronic depression. Despite her family's attempts to support her, Mihira IV found it difficult to accept help, which further isolated her emotionally. Her case illustrates the complex interplay between self-identity, responsibility, and depression. It also highlights the need for mental health interventions that address the specific emotional challenges faced by patients who are primary caregivers. The Mahira Research Center's study sheds light on the intricate ways in which depression manifests in patients suffering from chronic and severe illnesses. The cases of Mihira 1, Mihira 2, Mihira 3, and Mihira 4 underscore the diverse emotional landscapes that patients navigate, influenced by factors such as denial, social isolation, existential fear, and the burden of responsibility. Understanding these responses not only enriches our knowledge, but also guides us in developing more effective, empathetic care strategies for those battling both physical and mental health challenges. That is the end of your OET listening test. Now check the answers.